Hello everyone. In this video, we are going to talk about caching. Let's go over some basic explanation that you can find on the internet. In short, caching refers to the process of temporarily storing frequently accessed data so it can be accessed much faster and ease the load on the database or other kind of resources. Typically, you will encounter key value pairs where both the keys and the values are strings, as that is the easiest approach to use. Most likely, you will encounter one of the three scenarios. You will either use in-memory cache, you would use Redis inside a container, or you would use some cloud service like Azure Cache for Redis or AWS Elastic Cache for Redis. The basic approach to using cache is the demand cache pattern or cache site. When a request hits the application, it will double check inside the Redis if it finds the data for that request, which is basically called cache hit. If no data is found, it's a cache miss. So we are fetching data from the database and then updating the cache and returning data to the user. Now that we've taken a look at how we are going to use the cache, let's go over with in-memory cache implementation for .NET Core. As you can see, here is a sample solution without any controllers, without any services. So the first thing that we are going to do in order to add in-memory cache, we are going to say builder services add memory cache. Pretty easy, yeah? Okay, the next thing that we need is basically a controller. Let's say POC controller, controller base API controller and the route will be AP. Okay, so next we will need to have two methods, one for setting the data to the cache and one for retrieving the data from the cache. So for setting the data, I'll have a set method that will accept a string value and a string key. Okay, so in here we need to access the cache. For that, we are going to inject the private read-only iMemory cache service into our controller, initialize it from the constructor. And inside the method, we could say memory cache set. This method by default, as you can see, accepts a key and a value. However, we could also specify some memory cache entry options where we could specify, for example, the absolute expiration, which in our case I'll set data and now add seconds. For the absolute expiration refers to the actual expiration of the cache entry without considering the sliding expiration. This means that the cache will expire every 40 seconds. We could as well specify the sliding expiration. What is a sliding expiration? It's basically a specific timestamp within which the cache will expire if it is not used by anyone. I will set this to a time span of from seconds 10. So basically, if the cache is not requested for more than 10 seconds, it will expire. And here we have one more property named cache item priority, which basically defines the priority of keeping the value in the cache. The default value is set to normal and let's be serious, you're going to use it at the default property for 90% of the time. So yeah, I'm going to skip on this one. Basically in here we can return an OK result. And this will set the item to memory cache. In order for us to retrieve the data, we'll need another I action result with a get, which will accept a string key. Basically in here, if memory cache try get value, key out string value, return not found. In other case, return OK value. Basically, this method in here will let us 
first of all, see if there is a value with this specific key inside our cache. If not, return not found. If yes, return our value. I'll open Postman and in here I've already set up the API endpoints. So we have a test value and in here, let's see, hello world. Next, if I retrieve this from the get method, I will get a hello world response. This is fine. So the next thing that we are going to do is basically wait for a couple of seconds for the sliding expiration to kick in. So yeah, so I requested the value from the cache and as you can see, it's a 404 not found, which is basically what we expected it to do. This is the most basic way to set up cache in your solution. And as expected, it would have some caveats. The first one is if the application restarts, the data from the cache is lost. So if I'll go in here, add 100 seconds for the sliding expiration and 100 seconds for the absolute expiration. If I debug this, let me open Postman, request hello world. Now, if I restart the app and go to Postman once again, even if I request data that should be there, as you can see, it's not there. Although this is a problem, this is not really such a big one because the cache can be refilled once the app is up and running again. The next issue is a little bit worse. In-memory cache has one more problem, namely the scaling out. Because every instance will have its own cache that will not get shared across instances. And if the load balancer or traffic manager will decide to redirect you to another instance, well, you will be back to square one. This is where distributed caching comes into play. So I'm going to start my application. And in order to start with distributed caching, first of all, we'll need to get a Nubit package called Stack Exchange Redis. Basically install this in here. The next step would be to have a running Redis instance. Mine is running inside a Docker container. So as you can see in here, I will leave the Docker commands for you to pull the Redis image in and start it on the screen. The next step for us is basically to configure the connection. So in here, we'll specify Redis to the local host. It can work like this, but I will redundantly specify the port, which is the 6379 which is the default port for Redis. Next, we're going to go to our program.cs, remove this line of code, and in here, just say builder services at singleton. And here we need to add an iConnection multiplexer that you can find in here. Specify that we want to get the connection multiplexer in here builder configuration get connection string redis okay what this will do it will add to our application a connection multiplexer that will create our connections to our redis instance i'll go over to our po controller and then here remove these lines of code private read only i connection multiplexer in here so i'll initialize the field next what we are going to do in our set method i'm going to make it async so the next thing we will do is basically get our connection to the database so the connection multiplexer get database method in here so this will provide us with the i database instance and in here we are going to await database string set async where we specify the key and the value and remove this bunch of code. For our get method we will do roughly the same which will be basically string value equals await connection multiplexer get 
database string get async and here we specify a key of course we need to make the method asynchronous so in here like this if string is null or empty value return not found and i will run this solution and let's ensure that our solution is still up and running so in here i'll go to and resend the same payload get a 200 resend this hello world test to not found response so this is still working the same way as before but if we will restart the app and i'll request test once more i'll get the hello world response basically with the app restarted a couple of notes on the code in here basically on line 21 as you can see i got a database instance basically the connection multiplexer get database method accepts in here an id for the database by default it's set to minus one but you can specify an id of the database that you want to connect to this might be useful in a scenario when you are reusing the same Redis instance for multiple applications or multiple application components. The next thing is basically the Redis database has a neat touch of having both asynchronous and synchronous methods. So you could use it either way. And it has one more neat point which is basically the fire and forget functionality where you can specify that you don't care immediately about the result of the action and let it run in the background. This is somewhat useful in cases where you save data to your database and you don't want some transient failures in Redis to stop you from saving the changes to the database. This feature is turned on by using flex command flex fire and forget let's go over some things that we haven't really done well in our application first of all in the course of the video i have used the i connection multiplexer and the i in memory cache interfaces directly from my controller this is not really a good approach because this makes my controller method dependent on the concrete interfaces from different libraries. In other words, somewhat similar to depending on concrete implementations. In some simple scenario, this might be a totally valid example of you depending on connection multiplexer or I in memory cache. But in cases where you are creating a modular solution where the infrastructure components and the cache is nothing else than an infrastructure component, which should be pluggable and unpluggable. You will need to have an abstraction layer over the interfaces. This is achieved via the adapter pattern and the basic implementation might look like this and inside your methods you would implement it instead of the iConnection multiplexer or the in-memory cache. You would have a concrete instance of a cache accessor that would implement the interface in a fashion similar to this and that instance will depend on the connection multiplexer instead of your application so in there you will be able to switch the components really easily the next thing that we have done really wrong is basically our get async method in here as you can see this is basically retrieving the data from a cache instance usually in your code you would have a method similar to this one where you basically get our db instance you would try to get the value from the database and then if not call the database to get the value from there and set it into our value variable and then return it and then call the database to get the value from there if you don't find the value there you would return a 404 if you find a value, you set it to the value variable and return it to the end user, which is basically the example that I've described right here. So you get a request, you have a cache miss, you get to the database, 
retrieve the data, update the cache and return the response to the user. Well, this is not really a good example of how to use cache. Why I consider that is basically your method right now is responsible for two things. So we are breaking the single responsibility principle. The best way to refactor this is basically to create a decorator out of Redis cache and leave only the call to the database in the set method. You could find a way to elegantly do that in my decorator tutorial video, which I will link in the video somewhere in the right corner. Okay, at the end of the video, I would like to tell you about a couple of patterns that you might use in your application more often than not. Basically, the first one, as we previously discussed, is the demand cache or cache aside. The next one is primed cache. This is a pattern that we have used a couple of times. The idea is to prepare a cache before the requests are even made. Basically, at the startup of the system, you will load the cache with new data. For example, you might have a pattern where a certain part of the day, a certain set of categories of products are searched more often. You might have an adaptive mechanism that will prepare the cache for those periods of days. From other patterns you might encounter are the write through, read through, and write back cache. To be totally honest with you, I really doubt you are going to use them that much for the last three patterns above, the only one that comes right now to my mind is the write back cache pattern, which in theory is somewhat similar to how React.js uses a queue to push events to the backend to sync data in the background while keeping the UI interactive in case there is a slow backend API. In any case, I will leave a link in the description to a post that explains all of the above patterns if you are interested. Other than that, that is for today. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more videos like this and see you next time.